It's my understanding, at least, that in coming to this seminar, we're talking mainly to church folks, and I think that's correct. I think they're designed mainly, according to this, for the Advent people and, of course, our lovely guests who come in. And it would therefore be presumptuous of me to talk to you about stealing and killing. These things don't enter your minds. Uh, we are not exhorted against great crimes in an Adventist meeting, murder and drunkenness and so forth. But it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. These little things that we need to work on, and I mean all of us, from the pulpit to the back door. For we are told that when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, he's going to come. And we're holding up the coming of the Lord. And that's why it's important for us to address ourselves to, to little things in our lives. I told you I'm something of an outdoorsman. I enjoy the outdoors, and, and I love to read about it. And I read once about these majestic tigers of the Far East that sometimes their paws become so infected by tiny little parasites that they are actually immobilized. They cannot walk. Now, if you've ever seen one, this is the largest of the cat family, the tiger, larger than lions, and some consider them to be more dangerous. But they are so beautiful, so majestic in carriage. They walk as though they're kings of the jungle. And yet, if you can receive it, these great beasts, in all their regal splendor, immobilized by tiny little parasites infecting their paws. And we often are like that, irreproachable on great matters, and yet riddled through with small holes, little infirmities, insignificant, apparently inconsequential drawbacks so that we almost tend to overlook them, and yet when we face up to it, they are our biggest problem. Nobody here has a problem with murder or stealing. So it's no need to warn you against that. The small slips we need a warning against, and we need to consider ourselves, and who here does not need to be warned against those? Because, my friends, it's possible to be strong on 99 points, weak in just one, and then be lost. For we have to remember that a chain is no stronger than its weakest part, its weakest link. And in addressing myself to this, I do not suggest that there is a great breach of ethics or standards or anything else amongst us. But I do realize that character can ooze out drop by drop. And incessancy always works ruin our success. And especially in relationship to character. I can't forget an experience I had some time ago when all of a sudden my water bill went up considerably and I wondered what the problem was and discovered there was a leaky faucet and it wasn't just boring, just drop by drop. And yet, having its great effect by the month, character can ooze away like that, like leaking gas. Just barely leaking, almost imperceptibly. And yet a damage is being done and a danger is accumulating. An expense is skyrocketing. If it goes on day and night, day and night, no great cost at any single moment. But day and night and day and night, it takes its toll. I remember when a very outstanding and gifted man had a 
tragedy strike his character and he was dropped from the Lord's work. And I remember the statements that were made concerning him that he made a mistake. And if you knew of whom I spoke, I would never even bring it up. But Mrs. White says, no man comes to sudden ruin. Sometimes we hear of a great problem that brings a person to public attention and public reproach. But the problem did not begin there. For nobody comes to sudden ruin. It is a gradual process, says the servant of the Lord. And she said it begins with one violation of principle. Neglect of prayer. And uh, I tell you, the things I'm saying to you are things I say to myself and that I pray about in my personal quest of eternal life. So don't think I'm talking down to anybody. I'm talking to me. The Lord's servant says neglect of prayer can be the beginning of what eventually becomes that downward turn into the shadows, into shame and reproach and disgrace. Nobody comes to sudden ruin. It happens gradually, almost imperceptibly. One violation of principle, that innocent little excursion into folly, that party on Friday night, that one drag on a cigarette or a marijuana stick, that one little Flirtation begins the journey that eventually ends up with great heartache and great reproach. And so having escaped murder and theft and what we consider to be the great sins in these last days, God's people must come to the close work, small and fine. For it is this work that refines the character and puts on the finishing touches. I had the privilege, being an art lover, of visiting the great art museums of Italy. And I remember going into the one in Florence, and I remember how impressed I was with the paintings that I had read about and had seen in books for so long. Now I'm looking at them, the masterworks by the masters both in paintings and in sculpture in that great museum. And you know, almost anybody can do the broad strokes. But when one is ready to refine the painting, it's that, it's that little bit, touch by touch, a little here and a little there, that divides the men from the boys and sets the great artists apart from the others. There is a rough and ready way to work, but it's the fineness of detail which we praise, like filigree silver. It's that close work that amazes and captivates us. And so, beloved, today, it's not enough to say I'm not a thief. I am not a murderer. It's only enough when we can say by the grace of God, the character of Christ has been perfectly reproduced in me. The fine work. Let us consider Christ and this process of comparative morality that people get hung up on philosophically today. Christ, in commenting on some of these things, said one day, If you simply exchange courtesies, do not the publicans the same? If you're just nice to people who are nice to you, sinners do that. This is what Christ was saying. And there should be a difference between God's people and sinners. If you invite celebrities and special guests home for dinner, anybody will do that. But it takes a Christian to invite an enemy home to dinner. Someone you don't particularly care for. Through the spirit of prophecy, Christ has spoken of the exchange of gifts at Christmas time. And the idea, you give me one, I give you one. Anybody will do that. But the Christian is admonished to go out and buy a gift 
for some poor soul who can't possibly reciprocate. That's what I'm talking about, the finishing touches, because that's the way Jesus was. We've got to get, got to get rid of these little things. One day in watching a documentary natural film at the National Ge Geographic Society, I saw a great whale thrashing and carrying on in the ocean as though it was having a fit. And, and uh, in, a, in a little while they explained what was going on. This great whale traveling through the, the, the ocean had accumulated barnacles, same as a ship does. And there comes a time when the great whale is bothered by these little things. And he thrashes about wildly in an effort to dislodge them and shake them off. We Christians are not bothered by the big things. It's the little things. And as we get rid of them, these breaches and brambles, as we get rid of them, we give Christianity its highest meaning. And the Lord always addressed himself to this. In giving the Beatitudes, Christ launched into such heavy theology that even his disciples couldn't understand. And when they were able to get him aside, they, they seemed to have said to him, Lord, your music is too exquisite for our ears. We need you to break this down and help us to understand plainly what you mean. And Christ said, all right, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. And that's repeated over and over and over in that chapter. You have heard it said that if a man kills another, he is a murderer. But I say unto you that if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. You have heard it said that if a man commits adultery, he is worthy to be put to death. But I say unto you, if a man looks at a woman and lusts after her in his heart, he has committed adultery already. You see? The gross act? Oh, how terrible. Christ said, if you think it, you've done it in your heart. If you lust, you've done it in your heart. These are the little things that Christians have to get rid of in order to have characters like the character of our good Lord. Jesus said, if someone smites you on one side, turn the other cheek. Have we come to that yet? Someone said to me just flat out one day, Pastor, do you think that means that a Christian should become a doormat and everybody run over him? I don't think so. I think there are many defenses against that. Number one, the providence and grace of God, who will not allow anything to come upon you that you cannot bear. I trust God to do things for me, and I don't allow folk to ask me stupid questions like this. If somebody is about to destroy your wife, would you kill him? I don't need to worry myself with that. I trust God to keep me out of that. Deliver me not into temptation. So that we can depend on. Before the devil can come at you with any great problem, he's got to bring his little temptation by God and place it on the scale and get God's approval. If it's too heavy, he can't do it. The Bible says so. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also provide a way to escape, that you might be able to bear it. Now that's the promise and the pledge of God, based on the unquestionable authority of his own word. And ladies and gentlemen, you can believe what God says. So there is no excuse to say, I was overcome. If we are overcome by it, it's because we want to do it. It is said that some men, instead of running from temptation, crawl away, hoping it will catch them. Now the Lord has called upon us, beloved, to become priests. And I want to use this in the broadest sense. Everybody here is to be a witness in these last days. And God needs a witness. And people need models. They are tired of folk who talk one thing and live another. And they are just looking for somebody in whom Christ works. And when they find it, that person is attractive. And souls are one because of that. And so God says, you are a royal priesthood. You're all ministers. Now with that broad context, let me take a very specific counsel of Paul and see if we can broaden it. Paul is talking about who shall be a bishop. Who shall be a, a priest? And he begins by saying, he who ruleth well his own house. He doesn't say, he who does not steal. 
There are a lot of folks who don't steal who are not fit to represent Christ. Paul didn't say he who does not kill, but he who ruleth well his own house. Christianity is a wonderful religion for it sets up high standards and makes something out of people who are nothing. It makes them exemplary. It makes them astonishing when the real conversion takes place. They are amazing to their fellows and to their neighbors. This is what Christianity does. And it causes morality in man to ascend up to divinity. Mrs. White says, when Christ pervades you, you're not living a life like Christ's. You're living Christ's life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's profound. And wonderful. When you stop and think about it, that is fantastic. You are living Christ's life. It flows into you as surely as sap leaves, leaves the vine and flows into the branch. The life of Christ becomes your life. And not only does she say that, but she says in addition to that in Christ's Object Lessons, page 333, that your will becomes omnipotent when you are thus connected with Christ. Omnipotent? It seems almost blasphemous to apply such a word to humanity. And yet the promise is that when we are thoroughly connected, our wills become omnipotent, which means that whatever we will to do for God, we've got the power to carry through and to carry out. Would you say amen to that out there? And so, beloved, earth and heaven are met in solemn conjunction right here on earth in the character of one surrendered soul. That's why it's so serious that we do not just pass by these things, that we do not uh, uh, just uh, ignore them. And please don't consider me presumptuous when I come to this section about ruling well one's own house, because one of the great problems in our church today is wrecked home. It is such a serious problem that I carry this burden with me almost everywhere I go. The reason it is serious is because it's so unnecessary. Whenever two people have the same faith, there is no excuse for them not to get along. And when they do not, there is selfishness and sin somewhere in that relationship. I know that this is a high-pressure age, and we are under great tension. But a good home is supposed to relieve that tension. And the tension and problems in homes are going to keep some of us out of the kingdom of God. And so we might as well face up to it. Not talking about adultery now. Not talking about a man beating his wife up. Just talking about unhappiness and boredom and a lack of love and taking one another for granted and being selfish and and being unkind and being thoughtless. These are sins. And it is very difficult to be warm toward God and cold toward your mate. It's hard to be a Christian, even if it's not your fault in the home, when you bring a cloud to church with you every Sabbath. The devil knows how effective this tool is And God knows how unnecessary it is, and that compounds the problem and makes it a very serious one. The devil despises Christian homes. And here is where he works. And here is where he seeks to create a problem and a spectacle and a public reproach. Now, remembering the broader term of the ministry that we're all priests, a royal priesthood, then I will quote again a specific counsel and try to broaden it. Ellen White says that ministers are the devil's prime target. That means first. And the adulterous situation, his prime weapon. And who then can stand? And if someone flirts with you, do not presume that you are irresistibly handsome. It would happen if you were a hunchback and extremely ugly. The devil isn't concerned about your looks, it's your soul he's after. 
And he's got somebody who will help you to stain your character if you allow it. And if you entertain those thoughts, the devil will destroy us with it. Mrs. White says, of all the sins that God will punish, none is more grievous in his sight than the sin of causing others to do wrong. And there is one of the grave problems with this that I'm discussing. For whenever people become thus involved, it's always two or more. And when one is using another, that one is offending God and insulting God in a very, very special and flagrant way. And of all the sins God will punish, none is more grievous than that one leading another soul down the path to destruction. It's enough to pay for one's own sins, but to have to pay for several. I hate to think about it. And then what shall we do? We must, in a sense, become puritanical prudes. We must take nothing for granted. You know, we, the more education we get, the more loquacious we become. We love to talk and philosophize and rationalize. And when people have problems, we think we can sit and talk it all out. You can't. And there are times when people want to talk to you about delicate things. If your wife is not there or your husband is not there, you ought not do any counseling. I don't care what your intentions are. We have to be very careful for Satan is using his prime weapon against his prime target. When Joseph was accosted by the wife of Potiphar, and I have no doubt that she must have been something to behold, a very beautiful woman. The Egyptians are handsome people anyway. And this woman with her dirty motives came in to, 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 to stain and to seduce this young Hebrew. And in her quest, he tried to talk and explain, I can't do this against God. But she wasn't listening. And when she took hold of him, he ran. Sometimes that's all you got left to do is run. Don't try to explain. Don't try to talk it out on the phone. Hang up and run. Run for your life. Run for your soul. And turn all of your affection and attention toward your own wife and your own husband. I have an article from a medical journal in which a doctor discusses the psychological problems that come to his office. And he's not a psychiatrist. He talks about the placebo, a little pill made out of nothing but sugar that he dishes out to people. And he justifies it. He says it's a psychological problem. This helps. And that's what they come for help. And so he feel, feels morally responsible to give out sugar pills. And folk are coming into his office, according to this article, who are nothing more than walking doctor bills, and all they need is attention and affection from their husbands. He concludes, Brethren, this is the gospel that I'm preaching now. Because Christian homes, Mean spiritual churches and saved children. And because these things are all tied together, and because of the very clear counsel found in the spirit of prophecy along these lines, we need to turn our attention toward each other and make our homes sweet and romantic and exciting so that we joy in one another. For people can look at you and tell when your wife's face is the fairest face. They don't know all about the complexities of our message until they are taught, but they know how you behave at home. And it is in this way that we either encourage or we discourage souls from doing the will of the Lord. And so Paul says, here is the outline of a bishop or a minister. And do not ordain him unless he is faithful here. Let him forget the priesthood until he brings his own mind and body under the control of the Holy Spirit. Until he rules well his own house. 
He is not then ready for further and greater rulerships. And Paul says further, don't even associate with a man who does not know how to behave at home. He counsels that we show piety at home. You know, some think that Paul was insensible to domestic relationships and needs. Because once in one of his eagle moods, Paul said, I would that all men remain even as I. And it is thought that Paul was a celibate, that he never got married. And so his inspired opinion seems to darken the heavens. And some people think that Paul doesn't know how to counsel the married. But I want to tell you of all the Bible writers, none dealt with this more tenderly and delicately than St. Paul. There were times when he left his eagle moods and came down to earth and sat in the seat of ordinary men. And at those times, he became the supreme pragmatist and told the church how to conduct their houses and how to act at home. He was no ascetic, snubbing into communion and, and interpersonal relationships in the home. Paul said, wife, love your husband, honor him, respect him. And then he said, husbands, love your wives as your own flesh, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. This is the counsel that a church needs, the church that is preparing for the time of trouble and for the end of time. We need to read the spirit of prophecy. Last night I was talking after the service with a young person up here, and we got into this a little bit, and I thought it would bear repeating. You know, there's a powerful song that we sing in this hymnal, and it says, uh, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. You've, you've sung that. And there is a line in there that says, chart and compass come from thee. Chart and compass. Here is a nautical idea. A ship out on the sea needs a chart. That tells him where to go. A compass tells him if he's on course. The Bible is God's chart telling you how to go. The spirit of prophecy is his compass letting you know that you're on course or not. The Bible deals with broad principles, don't you see? The spirit of prophecy goes into detail. And that's the purpose of the spirit of prophecy in the church. And God tells his people that here is the principle in the word of God. It is a broad principle and cannot always cover and define every activity of humanity. I explained last night that when they wrote this, they didn't have any moving picture shows. Now I'm touching home now, aren't I? They didn't have any drive-in movies when they wrote this. They didn't even have cigarettes and cigars when they wrote this. And so God, in his supreme wisdom, inspired his prophets to write out broad principles that would cover drive-in theaters. Write it out, and it's in there. But when we came to the age of such things, then he said to his prophetess, Now I want you to explain this principle, and let my people know that there are some things that are malum in se. That's the lawyer's language for evil in itself, and they will never be right. And I don't care how you rationalize it, or how long time shall last, or how you think you've modernized your thinking, there are some things that will never be right. It will never be right to commit adultery, and therefore it will not be right to go watch it on the screen and sit in a parked car and see it. It'll never be right. If you live 500 years, it'll never be right. And that's why the spirit of prophecy goes into these details. We ought to become acquainted with these books. My homiletics teacher, who became one of the greatest preachers I've ever known, now retired from the General Conference, was a, a very bright fellow, and when he was young, he was very skeptical about the spirit of prophecy. So one day, in almost anger, he picked up volume one. He said, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to find out what's wrong with it, and I'm going to expose it. <laughs> when he got through, he was one of the greatest supporters of the spirit of prophecy I ever met anywhere. Why don't you try it? I was at one of our academies out here on the West Coast, and a young lady came in for counsel, and she had a problem, and I began to talk. I didn't quote anything. I was just talking. But I was quoting, and she recognized it. She said, isn't that Mrs. White? I said, yes. Oh, she said, I don't want to hear that. And I pointed out to her that folks were down on what they were not up on. 
and that only a fool judges a matter before he hears it. I want to know what you know about the spirit of prophecy. Found out she knew nothing. All she knew was that a lot of the sin she wanted to indulge, the spirit of prophecy said, thou shalt not. Well, we should love the spirit of prophecy for that, isn't that right? Why, we need the discipline of the spirit of prophecy. We need to study these inside testimonies that God has sent just to us. And believe me, we would not be what we are without it. Would you say amen out there? St. Paul also attacked another little problem, busybodying. I just finished an evangelistic campaign in Atlanta, Georgia, and we have the question and answer session where they write them out and have a fellow read them and we answer them. A question came in one night and it was amusing the way it was worded. It said, Dear Pastor, can't you tell these women something from the Bible about gossip? I said, Sure I can. So I turned over and read what what the apostle said about women who go idly from house to house. And after I read it with my nose turned up, then I said, now I want to read to you something about men who gossip. And I read Psalm 15, where David seemed to have been saying, Lord, who's going to heaven? He said, who shall abide in thy holy hill? And the Lord answers and says, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, he that's masculine, singular, subjective pronoun. Man, he that taketh not up a slander against his neighbor. Gossiping men are as bad as gossiping women and have always been. And gossip is wrong. And may I say further, gossip does not have to be a lie. You know, some people think they aren't gossiping unless they're lying on folks. You don't have to lie to gossip. Gossip is to take any unsavory, negative story about a person and circulate it. That's gossip, and it's wrong. If you know something negative and unsavory about a person, God tells you what to do. Go to that person and face him with it and try to save his soul by having a humble attitude yourself. You're not special when you go to him. Except by the grace of God, go with love and go with the gospel and let him know he can overcome it. And if he won't listen to you, then choose another discreet person. Don't choose a gossiper to go with you. Choose a discreet Christian and take two. And if he won't listen then, then you have to take him before the church. And that's soon enough. Now, if he listens the first time, don't tell it. That's why the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. That's not compromise. Ellen White says, if you know a person is living in sin and you cover it, compromise with it, it's written against your record as though you did it. But once you have faced the person and he has repented and you've prayed together and he is sorry for his sin, then don't tell it. If you love him, don't spread it around. Love then covers a multitude of sins. And we've got to come up on higher ground right here. Or else this little thing will undermine our characters and destroy our souls. I think of idleness. Idleness produces boredom. Makes people physically and spiritually and mentally lazy. Laziness is an acquired vice. We're not born this way. We get into this kind of a rut. And it is sinful in God's sight. And I'm referring especially to the kind of idleness that brings you home and flops you in a chair so that you cannot go out to witness and to spread the truth in these desperate times, that's wrong, beloved. And something's got to be done about it. For a person who will not share his faith is in a lost condition, the Spirit of Prophecy says. Sitting in church every week, paying tithe, would need a piece of meat if you put a gun to his head, but lost because he is idle and, and lazy and will not share his faith. And you know an idler isn't happy either. I read that an idler's day is 48 hours long and every hour is 120 minutes. It seems like time will never pass when you have nothing to do. But when you're busy, you wonder where it goes. Isn't that right? I, got, I heard the man announce that my daughter's in graduate school. I can't imagine a young man like myself having a daughter in graduate school. Can you? Could I possibly have passed that many years? Jesus preached a strange sermon one day. It's found in Matthew chapter 12. He talked about a man who saw a devil in his heart. 
And he rose up to cast him out. Now I want you to notice, the man was concerned about his condition. He was not happy with the devil residing in him. And he got rid of him. And that devil went out, according to Jesus, and found seven other devils, and they came around looking for a place to reside, and found none. And finally, he came back to the very man who had put him out, and when he got there, he found the place empty, Jesus said, and he moved in, and when he moved in, he brought seven other devils with him, so that the man was worse at the end than he was at the beginning. Now, Christ told that. I developed a sermon around that called the curse of emptiness. It's not enough to get rid of the devil. The man got rid of him. But you've got to uninvolve yourself with the devil and involve yourself with the Lord in order to grow spiritually and in order to develop character. Or else the devil will come back and finding the place empty will take up his old abode and your last condition will be worse than the beginning. And so God speaks of idle people, intrusive meddlers who speak much and think little, who don't even occupy their time with the study of the Word and with prayer, and having so much time on their hands resort to cannibalism. And that's the term Ellen White uses. And she said that they are human cannibals destroying one another's characters actually devouring one another with gossip. That's a strong and almost offensive term. If you've ever seen a revolting film on cannibalism, then you'll understand just how serious that charge is. We've got to learn to be quiet. The Bible warns against those who talk too much. It says, A fool uttereth all of his mind. I travel all over the world, and I can't speak any language except English, and perhaps that not perfectly, but I know how to keep quiet in seven languages <laughs> or more. And there are times when we would serve the Lord by just being quiet. Why are these little things so important? I read the story of a sculptor who was doing a tall statue, and it was coming out so well, 62 feet high, when someone came in, a master at sculpture, and asked about the detail of the hair. And the sculptor who was working on this massive statue said, Why on earth should I bother with a hair? It's 62 feet up in the air. Nobody will notice it. And he was told that God will notice it. There are things that men see... And often they recognize as facades and shams and fakes, but God sees the soul. He sees what man cannot see. And therefore, our best attention should go to these things. Oh, haven't you heard expressions like this? So-and-so is a good man, but he is satirical and he wounds and exasperates human feelings. Oh, beloved, if you're like that, you're not like Jesus yet. For Christ had his tenderest words for those who were most abused. And we've got to work until his image is reproduced in us. I consciously tried to practice these things as a pastor of a large church much larger than our church here, uh, I made it a habit to get to know people by name. And I want to just tell you about a little experience that I would stand at my church on Sabbath when there was standing room only and chairs in all the aisles and call every name that came out of the door. It took some discipline and some work, but I was interested. Now, there were some people who expected me to know them, after all, considering who they were. But there were some other folks who came out who were absolutely amazed that anybody could call their names. And you know folks like that are around us all the time. And I made up my mind that if anybody got my special attention, it was going to be folks that nobody else paid any attention to. And when you stop playing to the grandstand and treat those kinds of people well, everybody will think well of you. Oh, have you ever heard this? that uh, uh, he's a good man, but he's a little bit harsh in his judgments of others. Oh, someone said, never, never mock 
an earnest soul, a sneer at a soul trying to pray or preach, though he stumble and often fall. Do not mock him for his pouring out his soul in inexpressible agony. We don't know the struggle a man is going through. He might have made a mess of himself over and over and over again, but we have no right to judge him. We don't know how hard he's trying to overcome and how disgusted he is with himself. They tell me that when you get to heaven, if you get to heaven, there are going to be three great surprises for every one of us. Number one, we're going to be surprised that we are there. And number two, we're going to be surprised because there's some folks there we just knew would never make it. But they're going to be there. So don't go writing folks off. That's God's work and not ours. And number three, we're going to look for some of those polished hypocrites that we thought surely would be there. And because God knew what we didn't, they're not there. Three surprises. Speaking of polish. What does it mean? Good grammar? Knowing which fork to use at the table? I'm pretty sure that nobody's going to be lost because he ate his vegetables with a salad fork. I'm pretty sure of that. Then what does the Lord mean when he speaks of polish? Mrs. White uses the term over and over and over, and she speaks of a jewel being polished. And often that is done with heat and with the buffeting wheel. Polished. A man might have rough hands, but his soul might be polished. Because we're not talking about that social veneer which often covers the most detestable corruption. We're talking about a surrendered, simple soul that is yielded to Christ by faith. They become polished stones because they overcome the little things. In their lives. Have you ever heard this? He is a good man, but he's always suspicious of everybody's motives. Ellen White says an ultra-sensitive soul is not going to heaven. And the reason is they always think evil. And there's some of us so sensitive, we just can't bear for a person not to look at us, lest we think he must not like me. little thing like that going to keep people out of the kingdom. A little thing like that. One writer said that if you are like that, you ought to allow yourself to be taken in two or three times a week just that you might overcome. And you ought to go look in the mirror and stand there and tell yourself all every day so that you can overcome this thing. You ought to look at yourself in the mirror and say, you don't always tell the truth. And I don't believe a word you say. Faithful in little things. Guarding with jealousy the edges of the Sabbath. Isn't it, wouldn't it be sad for a person committed to Sabbath keeping to be lost for Sabbath breaking? Go to church every week. And lost for Sabbath breaking. Sitting in the pew breaking the Sabbath. I I, I have no special desire to be humorous, but I heard a story, and it is humorous. And it almost bears repeating about a man who drove up to church one Sabbath morning, and his car was all shined. You know how we wash them up for Sabbath. And a fellow was standing up on the steps, and he said, Oh, what a beautiful car that is. And the fellow said, If it wasn't the Sabbath, I'd tell you it's for sale. Man said, well, if this wasn't the Sabbath, I'd ask you how much you want for it. He said, well, if it wasn't the Sabbath, I'd tell you I'll take $1,500 for it. He said, if it wasn't the Sabbath, I'd tell you you got a deal. So they stood there and sold a car on the Sabbath. Now, having said all these, as we come to the conclusion of this brief message, you must be asking yourself, who then can be saved? If all these little offenses are enough to sink one, who can be saved? Well, you've already had a powerful series on righteousness by faith. I ought to presume that you know the answer. And I certainly don't have time to go into all the ramifications of that. But I want to tell you there is someone else on earth besides sinful human beings and demonic spirits. There is someone else and he's called the Holy Ghost. 
And when the Holy Spirit takes over a life, and when that life is thoroughly surrendered to Him, then by the power of God, the weakest soul, fully surrendered, who prays and trusts, can be saved. And I came upon a line that brought me out of my chair. It talked about the care with which Noah finished the ark. He used the pattern which God had given him. God gave him the dimensions. God told him how big, how wide, how high, where to put the window, where to put the door. And he faithfully followed the blueprint God had given. He used the very wood God told him to use. He didn't substitute pine for gopher wood. He used what God told him to use. He built it the way God said build it. But in that commentary, Ellen White says that Noah made the ark strong. Built it exactly the way God said build it. Followed all the instructions the way God said follow them. But after Noah had done everything he could do, she began to discuss the fury of the storm and the upheaval. And she says, quite simply, Noah's ark still could not weather that storm. He had done everything God told him to do. Still he came up short. And she said, God sent angels from heaven to keep and safeguard the ark. Now, I think the implication is clear. That when we surrender to Christ, and when we love his truth, and when we embrace it all, including the little details, the things that seem almost inconsequential, when we are careful in our hearts to please God in every respect, when we've done all we can to follow the instructions, we will never be as perfect as we ought to be in our own strength. And so God supplies. This is righteousness by faith. God sends the power. God sends the life of Christ. God sends the righteousness of Christ. God sends what we have to have in order to weather the storm. And the ark of Noah's time was successful. And every one of us may be, no matter how weak we feel personally. And that's the meaning of the cross. It deals with conduct. And there is no greater theology than this, that through the Christ, the, the cross of Christ, we may prevail. And if we do not prevail, then crosses are set up in vain, and we are making a mockery of Christianity. A year or two ago, a very unusual thing happened in Indianapolis. I happen to think of this because it's coming up now. They are all running around the track over there qualifying for the Big Indy 500. And a couple of years ago, there was a man who took the lead in that race, and he had gone over 480 miles. Uh, now he was ahead of the pack. And should he win, there would be hundreds of thousands of dollars in prizes and endorsements, and that man would become rich having won that one race. And they tell me just as important as all that is the glory of having your name written in the record book as one who won the Indy 500. And this man was now come to the last lap. He was leading the field. Everybody else was following in his dust. That man had a clear shot. I imagine his heart began to pound. He began to taste the victory. The wreath of triumph would be hung on his head. When all of a sudden, part way around the last lap, he felt his engine cough, and the motor failed, and the car slowed up, and that fellow in second place went zooming by, and then the fellow in third place went zooming by, and he lost the race in the last lap after driving almost 500 miles at breakneck speed, coming down the final stretch almost a victory, and lost his way because he ran out of gas. That must not happen to us, beloved. I want to pray now uh, that it shall not for you and for me. You know, I uh, almost interpret seminar as meaning interchange, a time to talk back and forth, but there's no time for that. It's almost time for the next service to begin, and if it's not overexposure, I expect you to stay in and listen to it. But right now, I want to pray for all who understood what I've talked about. And you feel as I do that you need God's help. Right now, if you do, I want you to kneel on your knees. Right now, please, with me. 
and let us pray. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege. We have felt your presence. Lord, when we look at ourselves, we realize that we've got a long way to go to be like our Lord. You've given us victories over great things. Lord, we are in your blessed truth, and we're in your remnant church, and our hearts are so grateful today. But none is lifted up because in spite of all you've done, we see our failures, our weaknesses, these little things that still mar our characters and stand in the way of eternal life. And Lord, we've just about given up hope that we can do anything about any of it. And so we turn to thee, for thou canst. You can save us. We ask you to put in our minds and in our hearts a hatred for sin. Help us, Lord, to will to do your will, and then give us cleansing for all our past transgressions. And having done that, we ask you then to give us victory and the life of Christ, that power that flows into our lives that makes us victorious Christians in the future. What we're doing, Lord, is asking you to do everything. For unless you do, we cannot be saved. Thank you for being willing, for loving us so, for your patience and your kindness. And Lord, as you look at this congregation, we're all on our knees because we all together sense that we are imperfect and we can only be considered perfect through the righteousness of Jesus Christ our Lord. So cover us with his life. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International Copyright American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. To order CDs or audio cassettes of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, Please call toll-free 1-800-233-4450. International calls, please dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. There you will discover the largest selection of genuine Adventist preaching available. American Cassette Ministries is not a one-man band. It's an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. You can trust ACM. There is no compromise here. If American Cassette Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. Our email address is info at americancassette.org. We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and financial support are important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. Peace coming soon.